playing career and how that was evolving into a, into a coaching career at the same time. Yeah, that's interesting because I, obviously going back and looking at my, my whole career in the game, like most everybody in my generation, it started at school. Absolutely. You know, small Catholic school, 500, 500 students coach, 500 kids right. in my Catholic school. And the only sport the PE teacher was interested in, funny enough, a Yorkshireman, Dower Yorkshireman, David Burgess, was basketball. Wow. wow. Forget football. Yeah. This is 1973. And it's right. what, as you go with this story, isn't it amazing how we all have that almost luck that we find someone that had an involvement in the game and that yes. loved the game, you know, to yes. introduce us. You know, it's just amazing. Yes. I mean, that, Mr. Burgess, we call him then, he was like, do you remember the film Kez? Yeah. <laughs> remember the PE teacher in Kez? Yeah. He's a little bit more, art well, he's a lot more articulate than that. But what he was, was that kind of very strong, very, you know, dominant personality, but he cared. That's the first thing that all of us say. When you came to school, the PE department was the best run department in the school. I'm going to tell you a story because people never believe this, but this is true. Every school year had its own basketball kit. Five different colors. Sure. Every school football team, own football kit. Wow. If you needed basketball shoes, go in the store. If you needed spikes for running, go in the store. Everything was set up. Everything was set up so whatever sport you did didn't matter. You were set up brilliantly. And this guy was just adamant, though, that basketball was it. The first thing we did in PE was basketball. He selected, instead of running basket PE lessons, the first thing he did was run school tryouts in wow. PE lessons. Wow. So it wasn't a case of, oh, I just fell into it. That's the way it was. Sure. And, and across the city, and across the city in Nottingham, Every single school played. In my first year, I played 24 games in the city, not the county, what's now year seven. Can you imagine that? It's amazing. Not that, club back games. Back in those days. Back in those yeah. days. 24 so you, school games. You went from school, You and we'll talk about in a minute when we talk about your coaching philosophy, because uh, I'd be really interested to know how your P teacher, did he mm. have a, a real impact in the actual coaching side? But you went and you were... Obviously, a talented player. You went straight mm -hmm. into um, county and then into kind of national league structure. Yes. How, yes. So, how did that progress? And 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 what so what ages then, are you talking you about? Make, then? Back then, you had to make you ready for this. It wasn't city boys. You had to get in the regional city team. Right. Okay. So the east of the city. Right. Then you made the city boys. And if you made the city boys, you had to go to the county trials. And if you made the county trials, of course, you went to the regional trials for the Midlands and so on and so on and so forth. So by the time I got into what's year nine, yeah, third year, is that? Yeah, no, year eight, I was obviously one of the better kids in the city up to the age of 16. Sure. So I'm playing under 17 basketball at 13, National League, 14. That's, wow. yeah, that was my thing. I'd give yeah. them all the other sports, track and field as a good footballer. My thing was basketball. Sure. And so to get to that level, you run through some people. So obviously at that time, my, my local league coach was outstanding. The first, the first basketball coach that I saw perform that had a pedigree was Peter Mintoff. <laughs> okay. He was coaching Nottingham's men's team. Wow. And it was Jimmy Smith, Jimmy Jumpshot Smith's first year. So as a 14-year-old, my first game was going to watch Nottingham men play what Rochdale KC, KCA or KAC, which would have been the forerunner to Manchester Giants. Wow. You know, that part of Lancashire was very strong. So Mintoff was my first coach that I saw, but my playing career went on from then. You played for England at under 15s. Who was the, who was your coach at under 15, uh, uh, with your England teams? Um, John Roberson was the assistant coach, and I'm going to say a guy called Peter Vaughan. Peter Vaughan, yeah. Right, was then the 15s coach. Alan Thompson from the Northeast was the head coach. Wow. At 17s, it was Mintoff and Rick Waldridge. Wow, okay, right. Yeah, so European championships in there. 
Um, the same again at 19s. And then from there, by that time, you, you know, I'd gone through a whole world of stuff. But going back to the playing career, once I got to 17, I'm on my way to Liverpool to become a professional. 17, 18, I should say. So I stopped playing junior basketball at 15 years old. I never played a game past 15. I played the men's game from 15 all the way to the rest of my career. So were you, you, at that time, you must have been the youngest National League player then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and potentially, if I'm not mistaken, Joe White would have taken that record in some sort of way, because that was what I was told when I was with Joe. And then subsequently, Andrew Sullivan broke that record when he right. played for London Towers right. when he was basically just over 15 years old. Like right. 15 and jo I left. was Joe's England captain on the 17s and 18s. Wow. I've known yeah. Joe since he was 13 years old. <laughs> okay. <laughs> People don't understand. Literally, me and Joe played against at every level. You know, obviously National League. We played against each other for the youth clubs. We, there was such a thing as the National Boys Clubs Championship. So we ran against each other all the time. But at 15, I'd played against Joe for a year or two. Sure. And, we, you know, I was his England captain. So me and Joe, were like, literally, we, we were young boys and we knew each other. So that's how long the big fella and I have a relationship. Yeah. Okay. We, we were roomies. We were roomies when we used to go away in the Europeans. Me and Joe were roomies. And just, just for, you know, this younger generation, just describe, you know, what type of player at that time you were becoming, you know, you were, I'm assuming like a, some sort of small forward. Oh, no, no, no. Let's tell you the story. I was a center. Wow. Really? I was the T. I I was 6'2 at 11. Wow. Okay. At 11 years old. I've only grown two inches, three inches. Sorry. I'm 6'4 now. Sure. So by the time I got to 15, however, yeah, I'd moved into like a small forwardy role. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the asset that you hired me for was twofold. First of all, I guard anybody. And second of all, I made the pass, the hockey pass. Right. So that was my football. But because of the football thing, that's the perception. My thing was passing the ball. So I made, the, that was always my thing. Who's find the open man? And that's, when I watch all stuff now, it's, everything's based around just court awareness, fine, fine, fine. decision making. And, and most of that came from football, really, if I'm going to be honest, because it was football, football, football till the age of 13. It, sorry, 12. Scoring wise, just get out into the open court, which was common to most of us, you know, to get out and get into open court. You know, the Euro step that they talk about? Yeah, sure. That's not new. No. <laughs> That, that's, that's as old as a day is long. That was my thing. Get you to go to the outside, come back to the inside and flip it. But I'd stole that from guys in Nottingham. Right. I, I, I find it funny they talk about the Eurostep like it's some new invention. Yeah. We were doing that in the 70s. In the early 70s. Well, pretty much everything to do with this game is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but that was my thing. In transition, athletically... Uh, people struggle with my, my foot speed and finishing ability. Didn't have a great jump shot. It's around 10 feet. You know, you played around the elbows, the short corners, coming off stuff. But could head fakes, get to the bucket, shot fakes, finish, make free throws, but really get you in transition and, and, and find a way to the, get to the bucket. That's what I started at. So at this time, you, were, you went to Liverpool. Um, yes. How did you end up back at Quarterdale and what was the, what was the, the well, progression? This... Mike Pyatt, if you remember Mike Pyatt? Yes, yeah. I played against yes. Mike Pyatt when Liverpool had won Division One as a 15-year-old. Wow, okay. So when they were putting the, what's now the BBL team together, 18 months later, my mother gets a call from Colin Bentley, who owned Liverpool and, and Vaughan Thomas. Yeah, Paul Thomas, yeah. Mother gives me a call when I get home from school. They said, there's these two guys called for you, right? That was Liverpool Basketball Club. I'm like, how did they find that? The funny thing is they got my number off Tuva Brown, who played against the USA Select team that Mike Pyatt had played for. Right, okay. Right, so I go to Liverpool and obviously spend two years there. And now, again, you're, you're 19 years old. You've played two years in that. The club's shaky, like most clubs were. It looks like it's going to go. 
when I get a call from Alan Thompson, who had been my England under 15 manager, saying that they were interested in having me come to play in Gateshead. Okay, so I leave, I go to Gateshead, and that was the best athletic experience I'd ever had. When I went there, as you know, Gateshead's big time athletics. Right? But they had a, a leisure center there that was two, two wooden courts, brilliant wooden courts. They had, back then we'd probably get 1,200 people in, weight room, track. I got all access to that in Gateshead. And so from a performance point of view, I've never been in a situation where literally I could get up, I'd go lift, I could stretch, I could eat, I can get physiotherapy, I can go to the track, I could do all that pre-work, and I'd get two, three hours a day to work on my game. So they allotted me time for me, separate from the team, to work on my game. And just it's real by far and away the biggest step I ever made. Who, who was coaching that team? Alan Thompson coached the first year. Sure. Right, and then Tony Hansen coached the... Oh, wow. No, no, Alan coached the... Yeah, and then Tony Hansen coached the second and third year that I was there. Wow. But and that, what, that set me... And what Go on. type of players were on that team? Who's, who would we know? Brian Calder. <laughs> okay. Tony Brown. Yeah. Juan Holcomb. Rod Camp. Ivan Whitfield, who else might you know? Well, on the second team, that's where I met Dougie and what, who we call Chicken, Gary Smith. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Sam Ellis was the American then. So Gateshead was the forerunner to Sunderland, which was the forerunner yes. to Newcastle. That's, yes, uh, yes. That's the yeah. evolution. Yeah, yeah. It became Tyneside in the second year, and then down the road it became Newcastle Eagles. Right. So from there, obviously, I go to Calderdale. Um, well, I go to Saudi Arabia to work with Randy Hafner. Oh, wow. I okay. took some time out of the game, and I went to Saudi Arabia for six months. As a coach? As yeah, a yeah, to do some coach. Well, Han Randy was the he head coach to work as his assistant. I mean, I just had enough of getting beaten, things not. I was very, very different, T. I mean, I just looked at where I was going, and I said, I've had enough of this. If nobody's doing it properly, I'm off. I was only 23. I'm very stubborn. If you're not doing it properly, I'm off. That hasn't changed. But Kat called me up, Gary Johnson. And said, listen, we're putting a crew together and I'm like, I'm done. He's like, no, you don't understand. We're putting a crew together. I'm done. So anyway, he keeps calling, keeps calling, keeps calling. He said, listen, Mike is coming. Micah Blunt. Finley. Buck. I'm like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> so I get back up off the plane. And I end up, and again, Tony, I get off the train in Halifax. And I'm looking up and there's nothing but hills. No, that's I'm like, what have I done? <laughs> There can't be any basketball played here, except when we won the league division one with Gateshead, my last game, the year that we won that division one championship, to win it all, we had to play against Cat in Calderdale. And there would have been 1,500 people in this sense. Wow. It was Bedlam. So in this little town in the middle of nowhere is this huge facil this facility that people of weekend just built. And they're rowdy. I don't know if you're anything about the Calderdale crew, but it, it was nowhere noisy. It was just, it was just as you imagine it, it was just so loud. And I enjoyed those two years like never before. And then my finals year was at Manchester with Jeff Jones. Okay. And who was on the, the Manchester team would have been what? Colin Will, Irish. Irish. Will Brown. Dave Gardner. Kevin Penny. And that was Keith the Manchester Ramsey. United team. No, they were Manchester Eagles then. Oh, Manchester Eagles. Okay. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, so, and, well, yeah, what is more or less, it was more or less, it was more or less Manchester, Manchester Giants. And what made you, what was the decision then? Because how, how old were you at that stage? 26, nearly 27. What, what made you decide that that was it? That was the, because most people I've spoken to said that you could have played on for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I could have, yeah. I was, I was in great shape. Um, I pride myself on that. But, um, Really being really candid with you, T, I put myself physically and mentally through a lot those, those years, 17 through, well, 15 through 27. I spent every summer in the US. I hadn't seen my family. I had a little daughter. I, you know, I literally was in New York City every summer working on my game, lifting, running, just all in. 
all in. There was no break for me. There's none of this somewhat summer and I'll see you in September. I went from literally May 1st by May 7th, I'm in the States playing, working camp. I, used to, I can remember one summer I worked seven weeks to camp just so I could play against the college kids every single night. Wow. Seven weeks straight. So I'd teach during the day and I'd play against these kids from Villanova, St. John's, you name it. I'd play against them every night as counselors. So, and I'd done this for years. So I'd given up my summer. And then thanks to Mike Pye, I got to play in some of the other tournaments in you know, the West 4th Street and all those things that people now pay homage to. But they were just summer leagues that I, I got to watch the great players. You know, you remember Gus Williams? You remember a guy called Gus Williams? Gus Williams. I remember playing against him, a street Michael place. Corrin, yeah. Michael Ray Richardson, and thinking, oh my God, what am I doing out here? What am I, <laughs> you know, one of those. And that experience led me to believe that if I'm going to lift every day, run every day, practice every day, eat the right foods every day, and then I turned around and I looked at the game and I could not see where it's going. You know, and I'll be honest with you, this is a, this is a time in the game where it was a drinking culture, there was a drugs culture, there was, let's, you know, had teammates come to practice drunk. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. And for me, I looked around and yes, there was Kingston and there was this and there was that, you know, I never had a problem playing against Bon Traeger and Joel and all that lot, but it just wasn't going anywhere. I wanted it to be what it is now. Mm. You're into it, the disciplines. I mean, I watched cassette tapes. I used to look at the score sheet and relive who I was going against. If I was guarding Joel, I'd watch all his games on TV. Wow. I'd record them. Von Traeger never had an issue guarding Von, ever, because I'd watched all his games. I knew exactly what he was. So I was into it like that. Yeah. I was making good money at Manchester, had a great time. But my, to be honest with you, my soul was, if, if I'm not doing it right, I ain't doing it. I'm not going to drive around. I'm not traveling around the UK being a journeyman. For, for what? So I wanted, the, I wanted the experience of doing it properly. So 